DiscerningHearts.com presents The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. For over 20 years, Dr. Bunsen has been active in the area of Catholic social communications and education, including writing, editing, and teaching on a variety of topics related to church history, the papacy, the saints, and Catholic culture. He is the faculty chair at the Catholic Distance University, a senior fellow of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, and the author or co-author of over 50 books, including the Encyclopedia of Catholic History and the best-selling biographies of St. Damien of Molokai and St. Kateri Tekakowitha. He also serves as a senior editor for the National Catholic Register and is a senior contributor to EWTN News. The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Matthew, thank you so much for joining me. It's a privilege to be here today, especially to talk about uh, an extraordinary doctor of the church. I couldn't be more pleased. And, and you and I had the extraordinary experience of being able to walk the same streets and to actually be in the same places where Catherine of Siena worshipped. Well, to be able to walk the streets of Siena, especially just a few days after having seen her tomb in Rome, and then to see her remarkable relics in Siena, uh, one has the impression that uh, we were able to make a journey with Catherine uh, from Rome to Siena and then back again to Rome. It, it, uh, it was a privilege, but it was also a, a potent reminder of why in the case of so many saints, it's vital when understanding them uh, to appreciate where they walked, where they lived, uh, the setting, the context of their spirituality, and some of the things that helped shape them uh, into the saints, in her case, a doctor of the church that, that she is. And we can add to the title of doctor of the church that she's also co-patroness of the city of Rome, She's patroness of Italy, and she's co-patroness of Europe, uh, all named by different popes, from, from uh, Blessed Paul VI to Blessed Pius IX to Venerable Pius XII. And then, of course, uh, uh, John Paul II held her in such great esteem uh, that he declared her the co-patroness of Europe. To really appreciate Catherine... We have to appreciate that whole beautiful setting of Tuscany, don't we? I mean, that really helped to shape her, didn't it? It did. Uh, We're looking at uh, someone who was a product of her age. Uh, And what I mean by that is that uh, she was the youngest of 25 children. Uh, Very few of them, of course, survived childhood of a wealthy dyer of Siena. And Siena, at the time of her birth, was a very prominent city. When Catherine came into the world in 1347, uh, Siena uh, was not simply the kind of beautiful historic relic that we see today. I mean, Siena is a, a beautiful, vibrant, active city today. Catherine was born into an era of the great sort of city-states of Italy. And Siena uh, was able to take a a place of of pride uh, with Florence and and other major cities of that region. And that's important because when we look at the very seal of the city of Siena, what do we see? We see the influence of the Dominicans. Uh, The Dominican symbol is right there on so many of the a testament to the place of the Dominicans, but in particular to the place of Catherine Benincasa, which was uh, the name that she had when she was born. And those are the streets that she wandered. And this is a a city built, uh, as you well know, Chris, on hills. Um, Everything seems to be at an angle. And everything seems to be an accommodation to the mountain, uh, to the hills very cathedral, the Duomo itself of Siena, seems built on layer after layer, uh, mounting higher and higher uh, with that the beautiful uh, stone 
uh, that anyone who, who visits Siena, of course, you're surprised because you round a corner and, and suddenly it's there looming above you. I mention all of this because the streets walked were those same streets. And there is this sense of uplift always with Siena, but it's also a place of great surprise. Uh, you round a corner and you see uh, new vistas. Uh, you see the whispers of the city as it must have been when Catherine was there. And we're taken back to the, the environment of faith in which she grew up. And at the age of six, the very age of six, she had a vision of Christ surrounded by his saints. And that happened there. That happened in that setting of Italy. The... Entire areas you so have just beautifully described. There is always the shadow wherever the sun is coming. There's the shadow of the church that is always looming over it. And as great a shadow is that influence of those Dominicans. The Dominic to understand Catherine is to understand the the beginning and the influence of this incredible preaching teaching order. Yes. Yeah. And. The influence of that is made clear uh, in her life early on, because from the time at the age of six that she had that vision, she was drawn to a life of prayer, a life of contemplation, of meditation. And uh, she expressed a lack of desire uh, to marry in the conventional sense and eschewed the, the call of her family her parents, who wanted her to be more like the girls of her age. Uh, and certainly a girl in a family of wealth, uh, dyers in Siena, in that part of the world, uh, could be very, very successful. And her persistence, though, uh, led to the fact that uh, when she was 16, she was able to join the, the third order of the Dominicans. And the radicalness of that, um, of the, the embrace of the mendicant life, must have been very jarring uh, for her parents, but she took to it quite naturally. But, but what did that entail? It entailed prayer, it entailed uh, contemplation, that, that contemplatio that we're going to be discussing in, in greater detail. But there were two other things that, that began immediately for Catherine at the age of 16. The first was a life of incredible activity, a life of incredible service, of one in which she was a nurse, she cared for lepers, she cared for the dying, those who died of cancer, uh, the people that no one else wanted to take care of. But the other was that she was forming very rapidly this personality, a, a force of nature in a way uh, that soon, because we have to remember that she died only at the age of 33, that in the, in the 17 years that passed from her embrace of the Third Order Dominicans, she filled in those less than two decades lifetimes of work, travel, service, and love. She, as you alluded to, came to, from a very large family. Being the youngest, but also being the girl, she would very much the attention of her mother, Lapa, who plays an important role in her life to the extent that, and we see this so often in those who have what we've come to know as mystical experiences, whether it's, you know, a Lucia at Fatima or, or a number of others that we could quote throughout history, but that, that mother who is testing and challenging, and mm -hmm. helps us to appreciate that her experiences that you've just chronicled for us, that they were tested not only by the church, but by that family who knows that person so well. Yes, yeah, it, it, exactly. And uh, I, th I think her mother was instrumental in uh, providing with her that setting uh, to allow the space for growth in the faith. Uh, for growth in love. I mean, what was the, the nickname that uh, Catherine had as, as a child? It was uh, Euphrosine. 
uh, which is a Greek word for joy. Mm -hmm. And she was a happy child. Uh, and, and so it's difficult for some people to understand why a, a child who grew up with so much love, with so much joy and happiness, should seemingly abandon everything, uh, all of the opportunities that the world seemed to be offering her, uh, and to uh, retreat, so to speak, into a life of, of abstinence and, and self-sacrifice and suffering. In, in point of fact, it, it was a reflection of her joy that, that prompted her to do this. And also, I would say, uh, a consequence of Catherine's genius. I mean, there's very clear evidence that, that Catherine had one of the finest minds of her era. And it was her very intellect, I think, that uh, assisted her so profoundly in developing um, her understanding of love and her, her love for Christ. So her vision for Christ when she was six years old uh, set the stage, I think, for her always pursuing Christ in her life. And it was very interesting, I think, that her parents understood enough about her uh, to eventually accept her decision. I mean, we think, for example, of the, the episode in which uh, she cut off all of her, her, her hair, her long hair, uh, in, in an effort, her parents said, to, to find a husband. Little things like that, that I think her, her parents came to understand that this is something truly unusual, and they did not seek uh, to punish it. The incident of cutting her hair, it, Matthew, that we've heard that story before in the life of another tremendous woman, a holy woman of that era, essentially maybe 100 years before, and that St. Clair. Mm -hmm. And when she did that, just to bring a, a, the point around, her, she there was great fear. And because of the importance of those marriages and the relationships. And so the cutting of the hair, that's a pretty dramatic moment, isn't it? Uh, it was, yeah. Uh, and it, it, as I said, it, it must have been very jarring uh, to the family. Uh, and we still see some efforts on, on the part of her parents to see if this is something really serious. Um, but Catherine persisted, and, and she was aided in this by the, the famous uh, vision of St. Dominic. Um, and eventually she was able to join what were called the, the Mantelate, uh, the Dominican Third Order, the, the tertiaries. And the health that had been slowly declining in Catherine because of, I think, the, the tension that was building in her, in her, her call to the religious life and in her life uh, that was opening up for her ended almost immediately uh, with her entry into uh, the, the, the Third Order, the Dominican Tertiaries. And she was something of an outlier even there, because as you know, most of the, the members at that point uh, were widows. Mm -hmm. And the expectations for tertiaries under those environments uh, were stringent. And I think there was some resistance initially to her. But again, there was this something truly remarkable about Catherine. Her personality uh, proved remarkably uh, convincing uh, to those that she encountered. Power of persuasion uh, by her words, but I think as much by her comportment. Uh, she was 16 years old when all of this was happening. And yet she was able to convince people of great maturity and certainly people of great spiritual maturity uh, that yes, she was sober-minded enough to do this, but she was also prayerful enough and loved enough to do this. There comes at this period a dramatic change in her lifestyle that even though she was still very much in the heart of the family, was a dramatic 
shift. And I'm talking about the cell that she would encounter below the stairs. And even though unlike a a young St. Benedict or others who have gone off in those times of encounter, those formative years, something would happen in those three years below that little staircase. Yeah, she was blossoming in the spiritual life. And all of these things were pointing toward uh, the event, uh, probably around 1368 when she was 21, uh, and her famous, uh, incredible mystical marriage with our Lord. Uh, And this is something, of course, that was covered enthusiastically by artists uh, in the years after her life, uh, in which she received a ring uh, from our Lord. And the thing that, that I find especially interesting about that is that Here was her mystical marriage. She could see the ring on her finger. It was as real to her as any golden ring that anyone could wear uh, in normal life. And for her, uh, this was part of her daily reality. Uh, In the same way that uh, she was able to see her guardian angel, Uh, she had the ability to gaze into the spiritual realm uh, in a way I think that no one else in in her circle certainly was able to do, but that never was a source for her of pride. Uh, It was something that she always didn't take for granted, but assumed would be there. You know, as we begin to really go into some of the tales of Catherine of Siena, I think it needs to be said, doesn't it, Matthew, that in some cases, when we hear stories of occurrences in the Middle Ages, they may seem to some ears as rather fanciful. Yes, yeah. And yet, for Catherine, the chronicling of much of what she experienced happened under the gaze of one of the Dominicans' most formidable personages in the form of Blessed Raymond of Capua. Uh, right. This was no f- fanciful person. Say. He's not <laughs> yes. a person of fancy. I mean, he... This is, this is a, not a gullible soul. That's right. This is one of the <laughs> trained Dominican order preacher men, not known for necessarily suffering fools. No, no. And uh, in, in 1374, Catherine makes her way to Florence. And What follows uh, is something that uh, is one of those lessons that we learn from other doctors of the church. We will discuss this, of course, in um, our conversations about uh, Catherine uh, uh, Teresa of Avila. We've seen this already with uh, Hildegard of Bingen. Uh, We see this with other doctors of the church, that those who are embarking on the spiritual life, especially to the degree that that Catherine and Hildegard and Teresa and others uh, did, they first and foremost submit themselves to the proper authority of the church, that the church serves as their guide, that they do not suffer from pride, they do not seek to go it alone, they embrace in every possible way the perfection of the virtues, the Eucharist above all in their lives. They make the the Eucharist central to their lives. They avail themselves of the sacraments of of penance. Uh, And Catherine was no exception. She went to Florence uh, almost certainly uh, to meet with the authorities of the Dominicans. And this was sensible on the part of the Dominicans, because by 1374, Catherine was acquiring a reputation as a brilliant, uh, prayerful person who was drawing other people to her. And so, understandably, the Dominicans wanted to make certain what they had. uh, Was she actually uh, faithful? Was she faithful to the teachings of the church? But also, was she submitting herself 
to the rightful authority of the church. And of course, Catherine always did. And so she was given as uh, her confessor and her spiritual director, one of the strongest of the Dominicans, as you say, uh, Raymond of Capua. And not only was he impressed with her as a person, and impressed with her spiritual development, of course, he went on to write of arguably the greatest life of Catherine. And yet this is a man who became the master general of the order of preachers. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is the order of Thomas Aquinas. So, I mean, even in the, his writings, there is a check upon check upon check. And I think that just needs to be really stated out because I think sometimes we become cynical, don't we, Matthew, when we think that in the experiences of these great saints that somehow that their teachings and everything else can be diminished because, well, it just uh, sounds too wild to be true. Right. Uh, and, and also, um, it's vital to stress the relationship of these saints and these doctors of the church with um, the institutional church, with the rightful authority of the church. Why? Because in an age like today, in which we have deconstructionism, we have revisionism, uh, we have efforts to kidnap uh, some of these saints, in particular the, the women doctors of the church. Hildegard of Bingen has been held up as a model of uh, proto-feminism. Uh, Catherine of Siena has been held up as a model of uh, a lone woman fighting the patriarchal power structures of the church, fighting a, a guerrilla war uh, against the institutional church uh, for the voice of women. It's important to know the truth about Catherine, that, that Catherine was given a place of honor and respect in the church by the church. And every step of the way in her life, she recognized the rightful authority of the church and submitted herself to the rightful authority of the church in the same way that every saint and every doctor of the church has done. And this is not a... a a guerrilla war, this was somebody who loved the church and who placed the good of the church in, in the foremost of her thoughts and her prayers. How is it that this young girl who is below the stairs becomes someone in a very short amount of time listened to in the courts of not only the papal courts, but is being heard by kings and queens? Yeah, well, it begins as it, as it usually does. Uh, we saw this with Hildegard of Bingen, that there are those who come to her for advice, for counsel. And the advice that she gives, the wisdom, the sagacity of someone of such a young age, really took people completely by surprise. And so greater and greater personages began coming to her, asking her for advice. And of course, with the the blessing of the Dominicans, the, the understanding of Raymond of Capua. Uh, she began receiving letters and then began sending letters. And of course, history has happily preserved more than 400 of Catherine's letters. Now, we also have to remember that she was dictating these because her, her skills in reading and writing were limited for most of her life, which makes even more uh, fascinating, uh, her command of language. Uh, she is a vivid writer. And her letters initially were sent to the, her friends, or the, the, the men and women who had, had sort of gravitated around her. But as more and more people began hearing about her, she became more and more involved in the life of Siena and the life of the church on first uh, regional and then a national scale in Italy and then of course on an international scale as her correspondence uh, began with the popes. And therein lies of course uh, some of her greatest accomplishments and some of her greatest achievements. We'll continue our conversation on the life and teachings of St. Catherine of Siena in our next episode. You've been listening to The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. 
to hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen.